All right, well, welcome to day two of CBO IQ, the Cube's continuous coverage. We're here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, overlooking the Charles River. The boats are out. All the students are, are practicing. And we're here with Sanjeev Mohan, Dave Vellante, Paul Gillen is also in the house. This is the premier chief data officer conference. Of course, we're bringing in chief data and AI officers now. Um, and we've got a public sector summit within the CDO IQ conference going on right down down the hallway here at the Hyatt. We're here with Karthik Ravindran, who's the general manager for Purview Data Governance at Microsoft. We're super excited to have you, Karthik. Thanks for coming on the Cube. How's it going? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Yeah, this is is this your first time at this event, or have you? Been no, here? it's actually it's just my second time. I was here the year before last, and glad to be back. So last time I was here was 2019. It's just amazing to see the growth of this event, uh, it's just skyrocketed. And, and I think it underscores the importance of data, of course, data and AI, mm -hmm. and governance is mm -hmm. the hot topic, mm -hmm. um, which is you know, awesome for this crowd. Yeah. Give us a sense as to your scope of responsibility, if you would, at Microsoft. Absolutely, yeah. So my name is Karthik, been at Microsoft now for about 24 years. This is going to be year 25. In my current role, I lead product and engineering for Microsoft Purview Data Governance. Purview is a much more broader solution that encompasses data security, data compliance, and data governance, and I lead the data governance pillar. Prior to my current role, I built and ran Microsoft's internal data office, which was a wonderful journey of transformation for us mm -hmm. internally in terms of how we evolved for plus decades of organically evolved data estates to a connected foundation that helped better apply data for Microsoft's internal purposes. And that journey taught us a lot in terms of data transformation journeys, including governance, not just being about technology, but also being about people, culture, change management, organizational evolution. And what we're really doing now in Purview Data Governance is taking a lot of those learnings that we had ourselves in terms of evolving our practices mm. and making it easier for our customers to avoid some of those missteps, as well as to be able to get to doing what they should be doing first and foremost, which is creating value from their data versus building a whole ton of infrastructure and apps to go do that. And uh, in our journey, it took us like about four to five years to get to a, a good place with our data governance initiatives. But the reason for that is because we spent almost two years just building technology and infrastructure and the next three practicing it. So we're hoping that with investments we're making in Purview, our customers can get faster to value from data, governing it responsibly and doing great things with their data versus having to build tech to do it. So in the conversations with Sanjeev, myself, others at the Cube Research, um, so Sanjeev at, at Sanjmo is an independent, mm -hmm. but it's part of the Cube Collective, and so mm -hmm. we work very closely. The, the, when we talk to customers, they say that they want to move to open table formats. And when we look at the, try to read the tea leaves in the marketplace, we've, we've put forth the premise that the point of control appears to be moving from the DBMS to the, to the catalog but not necessarily the point of value because the catalogs are being mm -hmm. open sourced in mm -hmm. so many places, not, mm -hmm. not everywhere, obviously. What's Microsoft's point of view on that? Is the premise valid? Are there parts of the premise that are valid? Would you totally disagree with that? Help us understand your, your perspective. Yeah, I think you will laid out the various moving parts that our customers are having to contend with today in terms of the decision making. And the way we like to tell the story is to take a step back and focus on what is actually driving these shifts, right? And in my perspective, that is this notion of connected data, which is starting to become increasingly important for our customers, where we included in Microsoft mm -hmm. evolved through several decades where we focused on data silos that supported individual business functions and units. Mm -hmm. And several of our customers' data investments have also organically evolved in a similar manner. But now as we get into the world of AI, and increasingly so like applications of AI, it's becoming very visible that the importance of connecting data from across the enterprise is going to be of paramount importance to truly get the value out of the data assets that you've grown over the years and that you're looking to grow forward. Mm -hmm. And when you start connecting data, you're going to have to wrestle with a lot of complexities in terms of the source systems, all being in various architectures, being in various data formats, and being able to bring all of that data and connect it together and create a unified veneer, not just for catalog and discovery, but also for data management, is going to be something that is of much critical consideration. I'll give you a real example. Customer data at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. We have like 100 plus systems inside Microsoft that emit customer data. Just basic account data, right? Who's the customer? Who's the account? Like, who's the, who's the contact? What's the address? What's the telephone number? Basic master data, 100 plus systems. Now you add on to that, like operational data, you add on to that engagement data, you're talking about another 100 plus systems. No enterprise, and by the way, this is a very common thing that we hmm, sure. see in several of our customers. And none of us have the luxury of saying, oh, we're going to hit a pause button, go to one master system that rules them all, no way. we get started. Yeah. Each of these systems, yeah. different formats, different technologies, right? 
integrating, bringing all of that data together into a common veneer is not only going to increase the, the complexity of the compute you need to do that, but it's also going to require you to look at a way to present that data in a format that's common versus reflecting all of the differences and the underpinning yeah. systems, right? So we see the shift towards what we call the, 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 the analytical paradigm of data management, which is start right and then shift left. And what we mean by that is start right in the sense that take your data from yes. wherever it comes. Yeah. You, don't have the, you don't have the luxury to put the pause button and say, I'm going to go yeah. remaster my source systems. No, bring in the data from across your systems. And by the way, this is going to be freaking big data, mm. right? Which means the compute you got to run to manage this thing and connect it and to keep it together is not going to be the same as the compute and the infrastructure that you deploy on your edges. Correct. So it's increasingly going to become important to start thinking about modernizing your infrastructure to handle that connected data ecosystem. And then how does yeah. the storage in turn get optimized for serving the kind of compute scale that you have to serve? That's why we see open table formats, the standardizations being incredibly useful to help customers. I, I, like if I may, that. when you yeah. say bring in, you mean make it accessible. You don't mean like necessarily move it. Okay. Ingesting, yeah. you're not right. making a copy of Yes, and there are two architecture patterns, right? Because this is a very important question. I'm glad you asked this. There's one architecture pattern, which is virtualization, which is keeping yes. the data where it is, pointing right. to it through symbolic links okay. and not copying and moving. Yes. But there's another genuine architecture pattern, which is a one copy architecture pattern, right? Which might also need to fit into the picture depending on the state of the originating systems. Mm. And the reason I say this is because, and we learned this the hard way at Microsoft. Like we've been, we've been first at it, we tried to do the 100 person virtualization thing and pointing compute to wherever data sits. And, and we just tried to create a common veneer, which is through an open format, but then the veneer basically just points back to your internal systems. You know what the risk in that is? The risk is some of your originating operational systems may not be ready to handle uh, that scale of compute. Yeah, right. And those systems are also serving other primary use cases which could be brought down to their knees. Yeah. One of the systems that we try to go to like large scale analytical compute against it literally choked up because mm -hmm. it wasn't set up to manage that kind of scale. Right? So depending on how deeply you are in some of the legacy sort of like stores, you might have to consider a one copy architecture where the right thing to do is to move the data into an analytical layer and then, which is hyper-optimized, both not just from a compute perspective, but also from a storage for that compute, yeah. right? And then make the right choices between when to virtualize and, you and support when to do both. copy. We support both. We have to support both, right? Yes. And to make it real for you, like if you look at some of the recent announcements in Microsoft Fabric, there's two concepts you've probably heard of, shortcutting and mirroring. Hmm. Fabric shortcuts are virtualization, right? That's about keeping the data where it is, pointing to the data where it sits, versus Fabric database mirroring hmm. is primarily designed to enable some of the data caching and mirroring that needs to happen for sources that are not set up to run and manage the scale of compute that is needed for today's workloads. Right. So I think it's a, it's an and, it's not necessarily an or. Yeah. So I have a question about what you said earlier about 100 different sources uh, mm -hmm. where customer information is stored. But then the, you have another 100 unstructured, like you know contracts, agreements, mm -hmm. licenses. Mm -hmm. So is unstructured data management and governance part of uh, purview of purview? Fantastic question. In fact, I would say increasingly in the age of AI, unstructured data is going to come to the front and center, right? Yes. I mean, any kind so, of governance solution. So I want to know how. Yeah. How do you do it? 100%, I'll speak yes. of it. So any governance solution that caters only to one or the other, as in structured or unstructured, is going to be incomplete. Yeah, it's music to I Further use. investments I love to bring that. together. Yeah. So with Microsoft Purview, what we've done now in Microsoft is we've taken what used to be two, I would say, orthogonal sets of investments inside the company. Hmm. There have been a whole bunch of investments around our security and compliance solutions, which were very anchored on Microsoft 365 and the unstructured information estate. Mm -hmm. So you're probably familiar with products like Microsoft Information Protection, mm -hmm. Data Loss Prevention, Data Lifecycle yep. Management. All of those were very anchored on the unstructured estate. Hmm. And right. then you've likely heard of what used to be Azure Purview, which yes. was more the data governance structured. platform for the structured data. Yes. Right. And we took a step back about 12 months back and looked at the commonality yeah. that is needed to truly sort of capital G govern an information estate, right? Yeah. So capital G governance encompasses security, compliance, risk management, and data management. Yeah. It's not just traditional data governance. Yeah. So when we looked at this opportunity, we said like, holy crap, look at this. You've got CISOs, information security officers, compliance officers, data officers, all of whom are today largely operating in silos, investing in their own infrastructures. Mm -hmm all of whom define and manage policies that are important to each other, but don't really come together in the most seamless way possible because of the systemic constraints and limitations. Mm. How cool would it be if we could bring together all of these investments into a single solution offering that spans the structured and the unstructured information estate, takes all the goodness that we've innovated on the unstructured estate and bring it to the structured data, and take the innovations on the structured data estate and bring it to the unstructured data estate and combine it together into one whole solution. 
that's Microsoft Burby, right? So I've heard Microsoft is starting a new lab and they're making a big investment in Barcelona uh, for graph uh, use cases. So is the idea to for unstructured data to extract entities into a graph and then make it uh, a govern it through purview? Uh, yeah, so let me talk a little bit about that. Great, great question. So the graph has actually existed within Microsoft for like decades now. Uh, I'm sure. If, if yes. you think about Microsoft yeah. 365, what yeah. do you think it operates on underneath? It's the Microsoft graph, right? Yeah. And the Microsoft graph itself, the, the users of the applications never get to see it because right. the experiences are like so seamlessly integrated into the right. workloads. But the data structure that's fundamentally supporting all of that richness, all of mm -hmm. that seamless interchange and exchange of information between the M365 apps, all of that is underneath powered by the Microsoft Graph, mm -hmm. right? And we have an internal infrastructure called the Substrate, which hosts the Graph, and there's a whole bunch of Go underneath that, right? Now, similarly, if you look at the Azure Data Estate and all of the Azure Data Cloud and Estates over there, you've got a Graph in the Azure world that manages all of that for the Azure operations. And now really what we're doing in Purview is, at least from the metadata management perspective, from the governance perspective, we are bringing those graphs together, hmm. right? Where I think about one single graph, one single graph which is not just a graph of your technical metadata, but which is also going to be a graph of your technical plus your semantic and business metadata, yeah. right? Which captures the entirety of what we now expand to and speak to as the digital estate, which is not just confined to data and data systems, structured and structured, but also applications, infrastructure, yeah. networks, bringing together a single digital view of that entire sort of like enterprise estate which then provides the underlying metadata foundation on top of which the workloads, whether it is governance or applied analytics, can activate, hmm. right? And that's the journey that we are on. So right? that unified metadata model is is actually unique in the yeah. industry and very powerful because now you can bring co-pilots on top of that and you can have the, the co-pilots take action confidently yeah. if it's governed. Okay, so we understand Purview is sort of a, a catalog of catalogs, mm -hmm. if you will. So when you think about uh, Snowflake's effort to 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 open source Polaris, um, keeping Horizon for the role based access control and all the, you know, yes, the capital G, I guess you, mm -hmm. you know, refer to the it. Business uh, metadata, uh, right? And, 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 then, and then the Unity being yeah. open sourced, etc. That doesn't affect you. Um, you're you're fine with all that. Um, let the customers do whatever they want to do, and then you'll provide a catalog, mm -hmm. Uber catalog, if you will. Mm -hmm. Can you? Clarify that, explain it, you know, validate person. That. Great point. So yeah, I mean, we see it as being totally complementary. And in fact, I would say the, the, the day and age of catalogs goes back to as early as the initial days of SQL Server. I'm sure that you're very yeah, well familiar. Yeah, dictionary, of course. Or you're very familiar, dictionary, exactly. you know, you're very familiar so. with the master database in SQL yes. Server. What do you think that is? That's the yeah. local SQL Server catalog, right? Right. So uh, we look at, there's not a single data cloud that cannot or should not have a point catalog that is optimized for that store. Hmm. Databricks have Unity, Snowflake have Polaris, Google have Googleplex or Dataplex, yeah. Amazon have Glue, right? And the reality is you do need those local catalogs. In fact, Microsoft Fabric will have its own local data catalog that's optimized for its data estate. Hmm. And these catalogs are meant to surface the artifacts within those data estates. They're meant to surface, I would say, data management capabilities for setting up ACLing and permissions and basic policies at the estate level. Yeah. But now, step forward and think about it through the lens of functions such as the data office, the privacy office, the security office. It's a very complicated task. And I can speak to this because when I was the, when I ran the data office for Microsoft, like my team constantly had to do this, which is going down to each of these physical systems and making sure that policies are configured and set up consistently. Figuring out how do you for our business users take all of the complexity of the technical metadata in each of these systems and abstract it into a business presentable mm -hmm. catalog. Super complicated challenges, which often require to build point connectors, point tools for these systems, versus taking a step back and saying, hey, why do I have to deal with the physical sort of like gnarliness of all of these systems? Is that a better opportunity where I can create a semantic view that is focused on business concepts, that is focused on durable business constructs, which can then be mapped at scale to underlying physical stores current and future? And then the business then gets to partake in the ecosystem, not just in terms of consuming the data, but also contributing to managing the data estate, especially since they've got the deep domain knowledge and context and understanding, being able to set policies that can transcend systems agnostic of where the data sits, like going back to the customer data example. Customer data sits in hundreds of systems in most organizations. If each customer or organization had to go and set policies and govern each of those systems, the sheer volume of the human task and the openness of the kind of errors and sort of like mal sort of like configuration of policies that could sort of surface from the human sort of like error quotient that can continue to increase because of the complexity of the task is huge. 
So what we want to do instead is to create a venue where you can look at your data estate through a business lens yeah. and where you can configure and manage your policies on durable business concepts and have it trickle down into your underlying data estates without needing to know the physical underpinnings of each system. Hmm. And then from a catalog perspective, being able to harvest these data estates and present a unified view of the catalog of catalogs where enterprise-wide consumers and users can search by business terms can type in natural language queries that are focused yeah. on business concepts, business needs, and discover data agnostic of where it sits is also a great opportunity for what we can do for the consumption side of the data, right? So that's kind so of so because you have the unified metadata, the operational, the, the technical metadata, you can now take responsibility for harmonizing mm -hmm. that data, the semantic layer I yep. refer to, uh, is, and then you can take action on top of that. On top of the semantic. And how much of this is production? Yes. And what I, like, for example, yeah. you've got customer data, unified semantic mm -hmm. view of customer data. Now, some of that customer data may be in Snowflake mm -hmm. as a external Polaris mm -hmm. uh, uh, iceberg table or in their proprietary. Some may be in Salesforce mm -hmm. and some may be in SQL Server. Mm -hmm. So now you've created the mm -hmm. semantic view and you're going to uh, do policy enforcement mm -hmm. across these. So uh, how much of this works today? Right. So you asked two very interesting questions. One is the unification challenge and yes. the broader sort of governance and management. Governance, right? correct. So the unification challenge, I would say that are some really killer solution providers in the market today, right? Like folks like, for instance, like Prophecy, like Cluden, Semarchy, Reltio. These companies have been doing incredible work, right? Like tackling this fundamental problem of master data sitting in multiple different systems, not just master for that matter, any data. Yeah, any data. Yeah. And applying, data. applying probabilistic models, machine learning techniques with human reinforced mm -hmm. AI to tackle the complex problem of stitching together these different disparate systems into what's called golden records of truth, Yeah. right? So that investment I would say has been happening for the last, I would say like, uh, several, I would say, years, yes. right? But that's one facet of data management. Correct. That doesn't cover all of the further richness that is needed around data quality management. Right. While you can argue that data quality is in parts master data management, it's also a superset of just mass data management. Mm. Then there's data cataloging, then there's data access management, mm. there's data observability, there's a whole bunch of other capabilities that need to surround that. Correct. Bringing all of that together, including integrating with the best-in-class providers for the first problem that you described, which is unification, is what we're doing in Purview, right? So in Purview, like for instance, we've got very deep integrations with Reltio, with uh, Prophecy, with Samarchy, as well as with Cluden. Mm. And then we're augmenting that with a whole set of surround management capabilities that can bring the whole spectrum of governance tools and solutions, right? Carbon. And in doing this, where are we at right now? So we've launched our private preview in December 2023. We launched our public preview in March 2024 at the Fabric Conference. As of now, we've got 1,400 active tenants who are looking at the- How much? 1,400 Thank active you. customers who are looking at the product and several of them using it super actively and looking to go live on it. Our general availability, I think we announced that earlier this week, Rohan announced that, is coming up on September 1st. We're really excited for that milestone. Yeah. And uh, so, yes, we've got a lot of momentum. There's a lot more to be done, but we're super excited. So, back to the original premise. If, is, if, if the source of value um, is shifting, source of control, sorry, is shifting mm -hmm. from database mm -hmm. management system to the, to the governance catalog, but the value is leapfrogging that mm -hmm. to the catalog of catalogs and then presumably the ability to combine tool chains and then take action. Yep. That, is that a valid premise? Do you see that as their new sort of value point? And not every company's gonna agree. Oracle's not gonna agree with this. It's gonna, value's gonna be in the DBMS for Oracle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And Snowflake would love it to stay into the, the DBMS, mm -hmm. but, it, but the trends given open table formats seem to be pushing in that direction. Do you agree with that premise? Yeah, I think, look, data by its very nature is federated. Yeah. Federated at different layers. Federated at the systems layer, federated at the ownership layer, and federated at the practice layer, right? The data systems historically are very well served what you would call your personas that are associated with building and operating your data systems. Primarily your data engineers, your data analysts, your data scientists, and ID operators. But in this day and age, there's a critical set of functions that complement those technical functions. This is the data office, the data steward, the data product owner. And these functions are not necessarily data engineers, analysts, and scientists. Bringing together the life cycle of data management for an organization needs you to stitch and create experiences for both these edges, right? And while the first set of personas are gonna be focused on, on the individual estates that they have to build and operate for their specific needs, the latter set of personas need to cut across and look across these systems. And they're also personas who operate at the business conceptual level, not at the technical underpinning level, right? And they also happen to be the domain experts, the subject experts who actually understand the business that the data is serving. Mm. 
And they are today underserved by solutions and tools that they can use to responsibly govern a complex multi-cloud hybrid, often estate. Yeah. So, so there is a huge gap in this market today for a solution that can help that critical set of personas who are vital to the data supply chain in any enterprise hmm. to not just be productive, but to also be effective in performing their tasks for the organization across the spectrum of physical mm. estates, right? And that's a gap that we're looking to go after with Purview, not just for data governance, but also for security and for compliance, mm. right? So we see it as being very complementary, right? That is no, it's not an and or an or, it is truly an and. And, and, but, <laughs> right. and that's a prerequisite for systems of agency. I mean, it, yeah. really, it truly is. Unified metadata, that broader view of 100%. capital G governance, et cetera. I, I, we are out of time, but I have to ask you, are customers asking you about Iceberg, the acquisition of Tabular by uh, Databricks? Do you have a point of view on that? What are you telling them? Yeah, there's a lot of interest right now in open table formats for two reasons. One is to be able to create a consistent format veneer across these multi-cloud estates. And the other is to benefit from that veneer, not just as a way to discover data, but also as a way to operationalize data management at scale versus having to deal with each of the different individual systems and formats. Now, there are several, I would say, postures that folks take in terms of a strong preference for one format over the other. So I think those, I would say, religious debates and wars around the formats will continue to happen. At the end of the day, I think there's a lot of similarity between these formats, while they have their nuances and the differences. I think there are some brilliant moves that have recently happened around initiatives, like for instance, the acquisition of, uh, of Tabular by Databricks. And even prior to that, I think Databricks did the uniform sort of like uh, strategy and then vice versa and Microsoft, we are behind the Xtable initiative in Apache Spark. Yep. And the way we see it at Microsoft is like, look, at the end of the day, you gotta give the customer the choice. Give the customer the choice, right? So we're not indexed on any of these religious postures and points of view on which format is better than the other. We are more focused on saying like, there are uh, viably, objectively good formats out there. Customers are gonna make their choices and picks based on various considerations. Agnostic of the pick that they make, we need to be able to support them. Right, and then eventually, will one of these formats prevail? Well, let's wait and see. Time will tell. Yeah, that's a good strategy. Yeah. You don't yeah, you yeah, have to good, choose yeah. the religion for them. Yeah. All right, Karthik, thanks so much. Absolutely, really, really appreciate you helping Pleasure. us understand these important issues. Awesome, thanks, yeah. fantastic. And, so and also, congratulations, you're going to finish 25, yeah, 25 years. Twenty-five years, wow. Yes, at Microsoft, this coming up at 25 this number. Yeah, looking forward that to that. Flies. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 yeah, awesome, fantastic. You started, All right, you started when you were 10 years old. All right, for Sanjeev Mohan, Paul Gillen is also in the house. This is Dave Vellante. The Cube's coverage of CDOIQ from Cambridge, Massachusetts, 2024 will continue right after this.